My name is Shis Q. I'm with Robotics at Google, and I'll be presenting a Neural Collision Clearance Estimator for Batched Motion Planning. This work was done in collaboration with Brian Ichter, Mariam Bandari, Tsongwe Edward Lee, and Alexandra Faust. Here's an overview of the talks, mostly for people who want to skip ahead to specific sections. The 50,000 foot view of this work is that we're combining traditional motion planning with machine learning in order to plan faster while man maintaining theoretical guarantees uh, about completeness and correctness. More specifically, we're taking an RRT and we're using a neural network as the collision checker. Why does this work? Well, first off, I should say uh, that our neural network is not directly outputting yay or nay, collision, no collision. Uh, it's actually outputting a uh, minimum separation distance or clearance between the robot and itself or the environment. Uh, and then we're taking that and thresholding it. Uh, separation distance is Lipschitz continuous, uh, so it's, it's learnable. Um, and it depends only on the poses of all the mobile bodies in the environment. So if you can uh, somehow represent those, give them to the neural network, uh, it should be able to learn the uh, separation distance. So that tells us that separation distance is learnable. Um, but then, of course, not everything that's learnable should be learned. Um, but in this case, uh, learning separation distance does speed up planning. Uh, and that's for a couple different reasons. Uh, the first is that neural networks uh, are very efficient at processing large batches of data. And as we all know, uh, motion planning is embarrassingly parallelizable. So that lends itself well to uh, speeding up with a neural network. The second reason is that it's easier to verify and repair a partially correct path than it is to plan from scratch. Uh, so sometimes the neural network makes mistakes and we end up um, getting a path that actually has some collisions in it, but we can check that path and make corrections to it. Uh, and that's still faster than if we had to plan the whole thing from scratch. So uh, the neural network has still helped us. The third reason is that neural networks are differentiable uh, and we can use the gradient to help us try to repair the path. And I'll get into that more later in the talk. Uh, so takeaway here is that um, we're using a neural network uh, and this allows us to speed up motion planning by up to 42% uh, over the state of the art geometric collision checker, GJK. The contributions from our work are threefold. The first is ClearanceNet, which is our neural network for estimating separation distance, uh, and also it's training hyperparameters. Um, we searched for these and we found that they uh, held across all of the environments that we tried. Our second contribution is ClearanceNet RRT. Uh, so this is um, the, the RRT that we're using ClearanceNet as a collision checker for. Um, and we also make some additional modifications uh, to make it work better with ClearanceNet. And the third contribution is a configurable workspace. Uh, so this is how we're parameterizing our, our workspace, um, and also an analysis of when it makes sense and doesn't make sense to use uh, ClearanceNet RRT. The motivation for this work is that collision checks are slow, and we need to do a lot of them for sampling-based motion planning. Exactly how slow depends on the environment. Uh, so we've got two example environments here that I'll be using in this talk. Uh, the first one on the left I'm calling RTD2. We're actually planning for the two KUKA arms though, so it's 14 degrees of freedom total. RTD2 is fixed in place, so we need to plan paths around it. Uh, for the R2D2 environment, it takes uh, 130 microseconds to do one collision check using our geometric collision checker. And over the course of building a single RRT, uh, that sums up to 1.9 seconds, which is 68% of the total planning time. The second environment on the right here I'm calling fetch. Uh, we're planning for the fetch robot, both the base and the arm. And this environment uh, takes 430 microseconds for a single collision check. And over the course of building a single RRT, uh, we spend a total of almost four and a half minutes on collision checking. 
which is 44% of the total planning time. Overall, uh, depending on the environment, collision checking can take up to 90% of the total planning time. What's especially galling about this is that most of those collision checks don't end up being all that important in the grand scheme of things. So I've got an example RRT here. We had to do many collision checks uh, for each of these edges in the graph. So all the red, green, and blue lines, we had to do lots of collision checks for. And at the end of the day, we extract this black path from start to goal. We care a lot about any collisions that occur on that path and not so much about collisions that occur in the rest of the environment. So in this work, we trade off speed for accuracy. We introduce a fast heuristic collision checker uh, that may make some mistakes, but that's okay because uh, when we have a candidate path, we can check just that path with our ground truth geometric collision checker. Uh, and that's still going to be much faster than having to check everything with it. I'm going to take a minute here to define our parameterized workspace because it's going to be important for the input to clearance net. Um, so we define a workspace configuration space, uh, which corresponds to a set of related workspaces where large portions are fixed, uh, but there are several objects that can move in between planning problems. So for example, if you're planning in a kitchen, then the, the walls are fixed, the table's fixed, the cupboards are fixed, uh, but the chairs might change position uh, between planning problems. Uh, so we would take the pose of the chairs and include that in our workspace configuration. So bringing that back to clearance net, uh, there are two inputs to clearance net. One is the workspace configuration that we just discussed, and the other is the state of the robot. Uh, and then the output of clearance net is the minimum clearance between the robot and itself or the environment. Uh, clearance net itself, uh, it's implemented as a two layer fully connected neural network. Uh, we tried different architectures, larger ones, and we can get more accurate results with larger networks, uh, but they're also slower. And so it ended up being not worthwhile. Here's an example input. So for the R2D2 environment, uh, the state of the robot uh, is the joint angles of the two arms. And then there's no workspace configuration because nothing in the environment moves. And say this outputs 0.1 meters, so no collision. Our se second example, fetch. Uh, the state of the robot is the base xy yaw and the joint angles of the arm. And then the workspace configuration is x and y for the cubes, so they can slide around on the floor and just Y for each of the two shelves. So they can slide along one edge of the environment. And in this uh, example, say it outputs 0.05, uh, negative 0.05 meters. So there is a collision in the environment. Here is a video of training uh, in the fetch environment. So we're randomizing the robot state and also the workspace configuration, uh, checking clearance with our geometric collision checker and then training clearance net on it. Here's the uh, accuracy performance of clearance net. Uh, we've got R2D2 environment on the left and fetch on the right, and we're comparing true clearance versus predicted clearance. So a perfect network would um, give us a very tight diagonal line you know, with a, a slope of one. Uh, so we can see here that uh, clearance net is, is reasonably accurate. Uh, as I said earlier, we can make it more accurate um, with a larger network, but it's it's also slower. Uh, uh, just to be clear, the uh, two failure modes are the top left and bottom right quadrants. So the top left is um, true collisions that clearance net predicts are free space, and the bottom right is uh, false alarms. Uh, clearance net cries wolf. Um, it's uh, actually free space, but clearance net thinks it's in collision. Here are the speed results. Um, so these two plots are showing some of the same data, but the one on the right is uh, zoomed way out, and it's also a log log scale. So that's why it um, doesn't look like the left plot 
necessarily fits in anywhere, but it is the, the left-hand part of the right plot. Uh, we're comparing to uh, GJK, our geometric collision checker. Those are the dotted lines. Um, note that they are the same regardless of the batch size. Uh, and the other thing to note here is that uh, clearance net becomes more efficient with larger batch sizes, and this continues up to very large batches. So once we have clearance net trained, uh, we can introduce a threshold uh, to get a binary collision classifier. So by default, we would take uh, zero to be the threshold. We would say clearance net predicts uh, clearance greater than zero. Then we say that's free space less than zero. Uh, we say that's a collision. And now we have a binary classifier. We can use it uh, as our collision checker in an RRT. And so that gives us clearance net RRT. Uh, we make a couple of modifications uh, to RRT to make it work better with clearance net. The first is that we introduce an adaptive threshold. So I said by default, our threshold would be zero. If you look at um, this blue outlined region here, uh, these are the points that are actually free space, but clearance net uh, predicts are in collision. So this can cause problems uh, if we need those points uh, in order to find a path from start to goal. Uh, so with the adaptive threshold, uh, we try to plan for a while using our default threshold. And then if we fail to find a path, we lower the threshold, say to negative five or so centimeters um, in, in this example, instead of zero. And so now anything predicted to be under uh, negative five centimeters, we call collision. But if it's only negative four centimeters, we'll say, okay, that's that's fine. We're gonna treat that as a uh, free space. So the, the cost of this is that um, now we're going to have some uh, points that are actually in collision that ClearanceNet says are, are free space. But this is okay because uh, we are going to check our final path using ground truth collision checker. Um, and we also hope that we've built enough of a tree uh, using our default threshold that there aren't going to be too many nodes in collision uh, in our final tree. The second modification we make is parallel edge checking. Uh, and this is in order to get uh, larger batch sizes for clearance net. So in this illustration here, uh, the black line is our candidate edge. It's extending from a tree node on the left to a randomly sampled node on the right. And so in a traditional RRT, we discretize it into all these red points. And then uh, starting from the left-hand side, we check them one at a time with our collision checker. And once we hit a collision, we truncate the edge there. For a clearance net RRT, we also discretize the edge in the same way. Uh, but instead of checking these nodes uh, one at a time, we feed all the red points into clearance net, uh, predict clearance for all of them. Uh, and then we just look at the clearances one at a time um, and truncate the edge at uh, the first clearance less than our threshold. The third modification is also to get larger batch sizes for clearance net. Uh, and this is that we introduce parallel extends. Uh, so in a standard RRT, we would sample one random point at a time and extend toward that point. In clearance net RRT, we sample multiple random points and extend towards them all at the same time uh, by batching all those candidate edges together and feeding them to clearance net together. Once we have our candidate path, we can check it using our ground truth collision checker. And if necessary, we'll attempt to use it to repair it using the gradients, gradient of clearance net. So here's an illustration of that. Uh, number one, we find a path from uh, blue circle to yellow star. Uh, second, we check each point along that path using our geometric collision checker. We find that these red points are in collision. Third, we try to shift those collisions using the gradient of clearance net, and I'll get further into how that works on the next slide. And then fourth, uh, we interpolate between those shifted points to find our final path. So recall that the input to clearance net includes the joint angles of the robot and the output is the clearance. So if we take the derivative of the clearance with respect to the joint angles, uh, we can find out which way we need to move the joints to increase the clearance. Here's a diagram of that. So we're looking at uh, joints. So we've just got 
two joints in, in this example, and then we've got a circular uh, obstacle in configuration space, and this uh, the circular obstacle has radius r. Now the, the blue, black, white coloring is the clearance in configuration space. So in the middle of the circle, uh, the clearance is negative r, so it's as in collision as possible. At the surface of the obstacle, the clearance is zero, and then uh, it increases as you move farther away from the obstacle. If you look at these red points, those are our configuration points, and the red arrows are the gradient. Uh, so that's the gradient of increasing clearance, and that tells us which way uh, we need to move the joints to move um, to move more into free space. This derivative is available uh, through back propagation, so we can just query the network for it. Finally, uh, we can check our path if gradient repair doesn't work for some reason. Um, we can take our, our candidate path in the diagram on the left. We can check each point along it uh, using our geometric collision checker. It's the diagram in the middle. And if we find that this uh, red section is in collision, we can excise that portion. And in the diagram on the right, we define a new planning problem around that bad portion, and we plan for that using a standard ROT. Here are results from ClearanceNet ROT, uh, R2D2 on the top, fetch on the bottom. The line plot, uh, we're showing cumulative success rate over time, where the solid blue line, you can see that we're finding more solutions faster than the competition. Uh, we're comparing to uh, a standard RRT with a geometric collision checker, um, that's the orange line, and then a learned baseline is the green line. And on the right, we have a breakdown of uh, how much time each method is spending in the various phases of path planning. Takeaway here is that uh, clearance net RRT can speed up motion planning by up to 42% over a standard RRT with a geometric collision checker. We also verified the method by deploying some of its motion plans to the real robot. And then a couple pieces of dirty laundry. Uh, the first is that uh, sometimes there are random changes to the TensorFlow code base, and those cause uh, clearance net speed to fluctuate. Second piece is that uh, clearance net relies on having accurate information about the state of the world, as does uh, all classical motion planning. And so unfortunately, because of this, when we were uh, shooting videos, we had to very carefully match the real world positions of everything to the simulation, which is not ideal. And the third piece is that in principle, um, the learned comparison method fast drawn could be sped up probably by the same um, parallelization method that we used for clearance net. Thank you for listening.